Hi, welcome back to Psychology as a Human Science here at the University of West Georgia. This video will be video number three in a series about getting started in this course. So in uh, the previous video, what we did was we were looking at some of the limitations of the natural science paradigm as it applies to the project of psychology. And I tried to provide you with some rationale for seeking out a method that is not quite so subject to the limitations of the natural science paradigm with respect to the project of understanding the human psyche. So in this video, I'd like to start out with introducing a little bit of specialized vocabulary that more or less describes the ideas we've already been through in the last two videos. So uh, just sort of tune into your notes. Uh, the first term is going to be the term positivism. Okay, so positivism is basically the philosophical idea that things can be known in a more or less definite and determinate manner. So, in other words, in a way that's ultimately detachable from all of the uh, ambiguity and imprecision of human perception. So, um, one way of characterizing human science psychology would be in terms of being post-positivistic. In other words, uh, a kind of movement within psychology that comes after the dream of thinking that we can know the human psyche in a more or less uh, determinate, definite, certain manner. That our understanding is therefore uh, subject to a certain degree of indeterminacy and a certain degree of imprecision, and that in no way uh, uh, negates the value of trying to understand the human psyche, but it's a way of recognizing that the human psyche and understanding the human psyche is fraught with uh, certain levels and kinds of difficulty that uh, other sorts of natural sciences, and here let me bring up the, the sort of example once again of chemistry, in a way that those are not. Okay, so in a way, in a rough and approximate way, uh, what we've been describing so far as human science psychology could also be described in terms of being a post-positivistic mode of psychology. In other words, after uh, letting go of the illusion of determinacy with respect to understanding human psychology. Uh, however, <laughs> we should probably also note in parallel with your notes that um, the thing about the whole issue of, de of determinacy and indeterminacy is that this positivistic dream isn't even accepted by modern physics. And by modern, I mean, uh, well, probably, uh, you know, ever since uh, the theory of general relativity, which happened in the early 20th century. So for the last hundred plus years, uh, the dream of being able to know things uh, in a positivistic way has already been passe, uh, which, <laughs> and I mentioned a couple examples of that in your notes. So the Schrodinger's cat paradox and uh, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle are all ways of, uh, which by the way, uh, those things are not recent. Those are like mid 20th century. They've been around for 70 or 80 years. Uh, those sorts of things already uh, destabilize the dream that even at the level of crude materiality, the world and reality cannot be known in a ultimately positivistic way. But what that means is that uh, the science of natural science psychology is not based on a 20th or even 21st century model of a scientific uh, certainty, uh, but rather on a much more Newtonian model. Okay, so uh, uh, the model that was, um, you know, in existence after Isaac Newton all the way up to the theory of relativity in the early 20th century. And I wish, uh, at this point, I wish I were telling you a joke. <laughs> actually, because there's something kind of silly about that, that, you know, psychology is still sort of struggling to catch up to modern physics with respect to its fundamental paradigm. Uh, but it's not much of a joke, or if it is, uh, I think it's kind of a bad one that we're so far behind the arc even of uh, physics. And uh, that seems pretty, pretty strange and a little bit pathetic, but, you know, 
so it goes, I guess, you know. So basically our department here at West Georgia specializes in post-positivistic modes of psychology rather than the more positivistic natural science modalities that constitute the bulk of psychology's mainstream. Okay, so I'm guessing at this point that's sort of an obvious thing for you to hear and for me to say for that matter. So let's get at the... Um, the real sort of deep question with respect to whether you personally buy all of this stuff or not. So we're going to take a little bit of a, a turn here. So the question is essentially how do you see reality? How do you see life? And there's something, like I said, uh, very personal about that because how we see life and reality and all of those sorts of things varies to an extent from person to person. So I want to sort of sharpen this question in a very personal and individual way for you, uh, the listener. So how do you actually see reality? Do you tend to see it more in a positivistic way where the fundamental operative principles that govern all things are uh, themselves governed by the animating spirit of a kind of determinism, okay, a kind of positivism, right? Like are things really sort of ultimately determinable in some sense? Or on the other hand, do you see reality and life and all of those kinds of constructs in a way where there's at least a sort of, a, what, a kind of current of mystery that runs right alongside how we're able to make sense of things in a way that might, from a certain perspective, seem determinate, but that ultimately it's not determinate because nothing is. Okay, so two different pretty basic ways of uh, seeing reality. And I'm going to argue that this is, uh, it may seem like, well, just a moot academic question, but I'm going to argue that actually it's a very important question with respect to your movement within psychology. Because if you see reality in a certain kind of way, you should probably... Uh, move within psychology in one particular direction. If you see it in the other way, you should probably move within psychology in another way. And if you see reality uh, perhaps in a third way altogether, maybe you should not even be a psychology major. Maybe you should, I don't know, maybe be a physics major or who knows what. Um, but at any rate, here's the uh, implicit question. Here's how I sharpened it up for you in your notes. For some people, question, could this be you? Seeing the big picture of reality in a positivistic way is attractive, okay? Like there's a pull to it because it makes everything seem more secure and predictable and certain. And for some people, like there's a tremendous attraction to seeing reality that way because the alternative makes uh, people of that persuasion feel a little more anxious and sort of destabilized and, uh, you know, they need to sort of take a Dramamine just to get through life or something like that. So on, on the other hand, seeing things in a post-positivistic way for these people tends to be anxiety-provoking, uh, mostly because it makes everything seem less stable and controllable. So if you're sort of, if you have a big sort of control project going on in life, right? Like seeing things in a post-positivistic way, it's probably going to irritate you, okay? And in fact, uh, the psychology program here at West Georgia is probably going to irritate you. And you should be asking this question now, since this is supposed to be the second course in your sequence, before you get sort of too woven into the specifics of the psychology program here. Because you don't need to be in a psychology program that's irritating you 90% of the time. Life already will offer you up more than enough irritation as you move through it. You don't need to go looking for more. Okay, so uh, if you see, see reality that way and, and like control and feeling like you're in control and finding a vision of the real that sort of is about control and sees things as more or less in control in a positivistic determinate certain type of way, then dude, like, wonder what you're going to be spending the next approximately two years of your life doing because two years of your life, I would argue, is way too long for you to be irritated 90% of the time. Just a thought. <laughs> right? So, okay, so that's one side of the equation. Now let's look at the other. For other people, however, it works in the exact opposite way. Seeing things without the definiteness and certainty of positivism makes life feel more adventurous. You know, when things aren't sort of certain and preordained, when everything's not sort of controlled all the way down to the nuts and bolts of the whole 
uh, mechanisms of reality. It makes things seem like sort of more of an adventure, like more exciting, more exhilarating in a way, you know? <laughs> so uh, more spontaneously creative and more meaningful. That's how I'm saying it in your notes. And conversely, the strictures of positivism tend to make life feel somewhat sterile and mechanical. So uh, I hope you're getting a sense for, man, this question that maybe seems so abstract and so tangential at first is actually pretty damn fundamental to how you're going to take up the task of being a psychology major, whether you should be here at West Georgia, maybe you should go to Georgia Tech. Who knows? You know, that's fine. That's, that's perfectly okay. Like if you discover, if part of your learning process in this class is that, hey, I'm in the wrong program, I would count that as a positive learning. We tend to underrate learnings in life that sort of uh, seem like they negate our, our projects and our desires and so on. But if Every time your projects and desires get negated, that's one less thing you need to wonder about. So if you discover in this class that, hey, this kind of psychology they do here is not for me, good, good. Because then you don't need to question. You can get on with your life. You can go somewhere else, study psychology in some other. That's a positive learning. That's a positive outcome for you, the student, for us too. Like we don't want to have lots of students here that are basically and fundamentally miserable. That doesn't serve us. And it doesn't serve you. <laughs> so uh, just a little uh, at this early juncture in the class and in, uh, within the larger arc of your bachelor's degree, you should be wondering about these things. Okay, so at the bottom of the page, the real question is the one I'm trying to pose to you. How do you see life? How do you see life in reality? <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is important because uh, whatever answer you have to this question will shape and inform your direction as a psychologist. Yeah, buddy. <laughs> All right. Sure, sure will. So, uh, next page of your notes. It, it's probably a good idea. Good is not the right word. It's probably a essential idea. Sine qua non, as the ancient Romans would say. That's a fancy phrase that means it is necessary for you to wonder about your relation to life. Wonder about your relation to life because you know, being a psychology major of a certain persuasion should be in the service of what you see and what you desire about life more generally. And if it's not, hopefully you're going to find the courage to change your direction. Hopefully you can find the courage within yourself to do that sort of thing, you know. Okay, so uh, I guess that's my homily for this little video. Okay, so the next little piece of the puzzle, which will bring us to the end of this video and bring us to the end of your getting started material, like I think I mentioned in the beginning of this video. Let's talk a little bit about the historical trajectory of the department here at West Georgia. By the way, uh, because of the uh, reorganization of the universe, of the universe, maybe of the universe, but at least of the university uh, here due to the COVID stuff, um, we're now the uh, Department of Anthropology, Psychology, and Sociology, I think. That it, they may be in another order. I'm not sure about that. So we have a combined uh, department and we have a psychology program. So they're changing the nomenclature and sort of the bureaucratic structure that, that corresponds to it. So, uh, but at any rate, <laughs> originally we had a psychology department until this year, actually. So uh, our psychology department, old school, had its origins in 1967. Whoa, the summer of love. A lot of hippie stuff going on then, all right? And when this guy by the name of Mike Ahrens, who was a protege of Abraham Maslow, who is a very famous humanistic psychologist, you'll be definitely hearing about him, uh, possibly two videos from now, something like that. Uh, so he was this protege of Abraham uh, Maslow, came here to West Georgia to found the psychology program as we currently know it. And in fact, uh, if you've ever been um, in the front of Melson Hall, there's this huge iron sculpture of this sort of outline of a person. Well, that person is Mike Ahrens, who is this uh, the founder of the program as we know it. Uh, or if you've gone into uh, Melson Hall, there's sort of a large-ish display case that has this sort of picture and text around it, old school, like it was sort of typed on a typewriter, except it's a lot bigger than that. And uh, that was also a quote from Mike Ahrens, this guy, this founder of the program. And here's a quote, I put it in your notes to give you an indicator of sort of where the program was coming from historically. And here's a quote, paradoxically, 
The program was initiated by a faculty of which few members at the time called themselves humanistic psychologists. They simply sensed out of their personal and professional experience that something important was missing from psychology and ed education. But very quickly it coalesced around the theme of humanistic psychology for sure. Now here's what's happened since 1967. So that was like 1967, like peace man, like peace. Okay, so, um, God, that sounded so authentic, didn't it? Not really. I wasn't old enough to be a hippie as such. I was old enough to sort of notice hippies, but during that hippie era in 1967, I was seven years old, and so I was sort of old enough to notice, like, hey, there's all these sort of long-haired young adults, like, walking around, and a lot of the time they had, like, sort of this weird look in their eyes. Like, I remember noticing that. Um, but at any rate, a lot of time over half a century has transpired since then. So where are we now? Where are we now in the 21st century? Well, like I said before, um, in the 21st century where we are now is our department characterizes itself not so much in terms of humanistic psychology. We see that as our uh, point of origin and to a large extent the tradition uh, that we followed you know, within our historical arc. But these days we describe ourselves much more frequently in terms of this post-positivistic type language, you know, or human science psychology type language rather than humanistic psychology specifically. So really the focus has broadened out quite a bit since 1967. So, um, okay to include other modes of post-positivistic psychology, so the scope is broadened out, and I listed some of them, transpersonal psychology, which is, um, well, you'll be hearing about that later in the course, but for now, since I mentioned it, let me give you a little bit. It's sort of like a, an outgrowth of humanistic psychology, let's put it that way, critical psychology, discourse analysis, you'll be hearing about all of these things later on in the semester. So uh, the way you should think about our program now is that it's much more broadly post-positivistic, although its tradition and its roots are in humanistic psychology, which I, like I said is going to be the next uh, massive material in this series of videos. So there it is, the end of the notes. The upshot is that our department's tradition is very much rooted in humanistic psychology. In fact, there's a whole course specifically on humanistic psychology, that's Psych 4000, and I actually teach that course. I have taught it for quite a while, and there's videos on the YouTube channel about that, like if you want to sort of hear in more detail than you're going to hear about in this class about humanistic psychology. Actually, there's an entire course, the entire 4000 level course is on YouTube, because that's how much I care. In any case, okay, so we have successfully gotten through the first arc of material in this class, the getting started material, and like I keep telling you, almost as though it might be an indicator that it's gonna happen, in the next video we'll be talking about humanistic psychology more specifically so that you can get a handle on uh, the tradition, know it, understand it, be able to talk about its thinkers a little bit, and uh, who knows, maybe you'll want to emphasize that if you get turned on by it, you know, in your later courses. You can certainly take the Psych 4000 class, which is specifically about that. But for now, it's a done deal. So congratulations on getting to the end of the Getting Started material. You rock! Have a great day. Have a wonderful one. Take care now.